Liar. Everywhere. On NetRootsRadio.com. David Waldman. Kagra. In the morning. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It's Wednesday, January 17th, 2024. Time for another show, now that you would know it from the live stream. Once again, knocked out by extreme weather. Uh, stop burning first those fossil fuels, everybody. It's only, it's your fault, actually, really. Uh, I don't know. I guess I have a note here from Justice that says, Internet went down again last night, and they say it'll be restored after noon our time, which means uh, more than an hour, possibly, even more than an hour after we finish our show. So, I don't know. We're going to have to record a show as if nothing were going on here on the East Coast, even though it is bitterly cold here. We finally got the deep cold weather that had been plaguing much of the middle of the country. And uh, after, I guess, uh, I don't know, putting a damper, let's say, on the experience of the Republican Iowa caucuses, and really, who cares? Uh, it's shifted out this way. So, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty chilly start to the morning. The schools are closed for the kids who are going to the public schools here. Uh, I miss getting those calls in the morning a little bit. I mean, I never really loved getting them early, early in the morning, although they were always good news calls. But, you know, you don't really want the phone ringing at 6 a.m. to say, just wanted to wake you up and let you know that you didn't have to wake up. But, you know, you've got to get up anyhow. Uh, but the kids, the kids, won't anybody think of the children? And of course, uh, I've been uh, hoping to hear the voice of Wade Byard returning to those phone calls for many years, for all the years that my kids were in public schools. Wade Byard, the voice of, hey, there's no school today, kids, and a uh, very welcome voice in most homes in Loudoun County. And then remember, they tried to, do you remember the name? They tried to vilify Wade Byard. With the Yunkin administration lawsuits against Loudoun County, et cetera, et cetera, and then I even brought criminal charges against him, of which he was acquitted inside of like an hour, as I understand. Very quickly acquitted and uh, had his case dismissed, found not guilty, whatnot, and uh, wonderful. Okay. So, you know, I think he's back. I think he was rehired, but I, 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 I don't have kids in the school anymore, so I haven't heard his voice. Uh, oh, wells. Anyhow, I assume he's uh, A-OK and doing fine and hopefully staying warm. Same for Greg, who's just now realizing, hey, yeah, no live stream this morning. We'll go through the same exercise again with everybody today. Greg says he'll make his way in in the next minute or so, so I'll just waste my time here for another minute or so while we're waiting on him. Lots of uh, interesting stories to go with today. I guess the E. Jean Carroll uh, the second half of the second trial continues on today. I don't know whether there's any new controversies to get to. Uh, later on in today's show, I might like to return to the end of that Howell Rains story from yesterday about the Civil War history. We got the, the meat of it in there so that you got some idea of what this Dunning School had done to the American understanding of the Civil War. So you have a new villain to think about. Uh, but there was some very interesting parts in the conclusion, probably about three quarters of the way through that story. So I'd like to return to that. And uh, let's see, what else have we parked? Oh, I have a very interesting story uh, that I saw one of our uh, good social media friends point out to us yesterday. So I'll just tease it that way and say it's a, it's a really good and interesting story and uh, much more relatable to uh, the news events of the day rather than our uh, necessary understanding of the historical background for the news events of today. But here's Greg Dworkin, probably with a little bit of both. Uh, good morning, Greg. How are you? Good morning. So the uh, yeah, stream too. is down. Rumbly. Yes. And I, I couldn't hear the introduction. I said you were great. I'm going to pretend uh, like uh, I used to do with my father-in-law. What you were saying was really super interesting. I was listening all along. Uh, yeah, like uh, it reminds me of that. There was one one of the greatest Saturday Night Live uh, fake commercials of all time, really. And the recent one was, I think, that their knockoff of those home assistants, the Alexa, et cetera. Uh, the one for seniors that would answer to any name, of course. Uh, uh -huh. uh, but I don't know if you caught that. One of the greatest of all times, but it had an uh-huh mode. Yeah. 
<laughs> so uh-huh. I could have a conversation with you. Uh huh. So then I said to him, you know, <laughs> it was really good. And it was well done, well acted, and uh, true to life. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, but uh, if it's not interrupting you, it's not really true to life. Right. True. Well, yeah, that's true. It waits for the uh huh. Uh, chimes in during a lull, I guess. But maybe you can adjust the algorithm. I guess. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, some uh-huh. things, including the Iowa caucuses. Oh, that was, yeah, it was very cold. Now it's yeah, cold this here. Is, uh, this is Wednesday. Thank God it's over Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, usually Wednesday is the day we round up the previous contest, but they, of course, did their thing on a Monday, so we're doing it on Wednesday anyway. All right. Well, yeah, it hasn't well, changed you know, much. Uh, next week, uh, it's Tuesday, New Hampshire, so right. we'll do that one on Wednesday. Yeah. Well, we're because, doing this on Wednesday. you know, the, the media is absolutely committed to the concept that Nikki Haley on a hot streak might <laughs> hold uh, Donald Trump to under 50. Well, and, all right. Uh, let's talk about well, this commit- hourly because that's a whole lot better than talking about his uh, legal, political, and uh, moral uh, failings. Oh, well, see, now I find those more exciting, but it is a good story. I don't mind talking about the fact that as uh, people have been chatting – just this very morning about uh, Iowa, like of all the committed Republicans who dragged themselves out in the freezing cold, uh, half of them didn't like Trump all that much. Right. 49 percent, in fact, of an older, whiter, evangelical Colder. electorate uh, in a low yeah. turnout election. Right. There was only like 108,000 people there. Usually you get, well, I don't know, uh, 160, 180 they were expecting. Hmm. So well, there's uh, a little cold. Uh, Taylor Swift averages uh, seventy six thousand on her tour, so this hmm. is just a little bit more than that, but not a lot. Yeah. Well, they and, all stand uh, in the same all corner. All right. Now, I mean, what was wasn't great for him. his numbers. I mean, he won. He won by thirty ha- points. Did. Right. The greatest victory of all time. Or something. Well, you know, sure. if you're, it, it was in Iowa uh, in terms of the percentage that. Yeah, uh, I guess you can't that argue. He beat the other guys. Right. Uh, or the, the worst rest of the field of all time. Well, that's actually what it was, ah. plus the fact that people aren't all that psyched about it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there was uh, this week, The Atlantic had some really interesting articles. There were four or five of them uh, that I picked to talk about. In fact, one of them was on the uh, Pundit Roundup this morning. OK. And it was by McKay Coppins. And oh, yeah. He had, he had an interesting observation. He said, you know, you should go to a Trump rally. That, I mean, and there was a lot of interest in I'm that observation. That. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, it, also not in the cold. but Well, you know, I mean, you, David, and get well, COVID. You, you won't even watch a debate. No. That, yeah, I'm a tough sell. <laughs> For out, Go outside. I mean, no That's hard already. Go to a Trump rally outdoors. Yeah, right. And go outside and, and go near Trump. Uh, right. That's another sort of barrier for me. It's See, not close. But his point is, yes, and he writes this, if want. one thing has notably changed, noticeably it, changed it has. since 2016, it's how the audience reacts to Trump. During the first campaign, the improvised material was everybody looked forward to, and the written sections felt like box checking. But in Mason City, the off-script riffs, many of which revolved around the 2020 election, turned rambly, and the crowd seemed to lose the interest. At one point, a woman in front of me rolled her eyes and said, he's just babbling now. She left a few minutes later, joining a steady stream of early exiters. And I wondered then whether even the most loyal Trump supporters might be surprised if they were to see their leader speak in person. So my own takeaway, he says, Mm -hmm. was that there's a reason Trump is no longer the cultural phenomenon. He was in 2016. The novelty is worn off. Sure. But he also seems to have lost the instinct for entertainment that once made him so interesting to audiences. He relies on a shorthand legible only to his most dedicated followers. Of course, uh, uh, oh, the extreme Santos online. is even worse, yeah. but, you know, it's it's MAGA babble. And his tendency to get lost in rhetorical cul-de-sacs of self-pity and anger wears thin. This doesn't necessarily make him less dangerous. Mm. No. There's a rote quality now to his darkest rhetoric that I found more unnerving than when it used to command wall-to-wall news coverage. Yeah, mm. and uh, as... Uh, Did it. As the founder of uh, of the law said, uh, yeah, you can make any connections and uh, uh, contrast with Nazi Germany you want. Mm. Okay. Yeah, we're free to do it. Uh, he's making it easy. Uh, all right. Well, yeah, that was a real phenomenon over the weekend was uh, not just Coppins, but lots of writing about how everybody should should go 
Like you missed the, the last ten years somehow. I well, think you have a pretty good know, idea. They they used to be entertaining and they were, uh, were you they? know tailgate parties, and now yeah. they're boring. Um. Okay. I mean, right. I can you, accept that. It used as to a be fact. like going to a Michigan football game oh. around the Nationals, and now it's like going to a, a Jets game. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean, crazy there's a difference. Yeah, that's true. Although I do feel like it's been a while. People have been noting early exiters and people saying this is boring rambling for a while now. And he's been losing for a while. He only won yeah. it one time. I mean, I think that I, I think it might be new to McKay Coppins. It would be new to me. I have not gone. I haven't done any reporting on it. But I feel like other people who who have been covering the rallies for a while have been saying, yeah, there's a portion where the crowd gets bored or falls silent or starts looking at their phones or leaves early or, or goes to sack the Capitol while he's still talking or something like that. Uh, th- this has been going on for some time, but, uh, yeah, everyone was passing. Their- and I also noted, by the way, that uh, 2016's main theme for reporters like Coppins was uh, the headline of, I went to a Trump rally so you don't have to. Yeah. And now the 2024 headline is, you have to. Actually, <laughs> but what happened to I'm sick I, so, of being here by myself? You come to. <laughs> yeah, you know, maybe but, I need you as a human shield. But perhaps the bigger picture there is that he's simply not using his rallies the same way. He's not the ah. same politician. He doesn't do he things has lost the same the way. And he's Ten. not using the rallies the same way. He's trying and failing hmm. to use courts the same way. You see, what happened ah, is warmer. that uh, the media finally got wise and stopped covering the rallies. He got really ticked off at them. He was yelling at the NB, MSNBC, well, for example, because they wouldn't rallies. cover his victory speech in Iowa. He was like, who cares? Yeah, well, that's boring for sure. Yeah. Right. So okay. instead, he shows up at trials where he's not required to and then tries to make a speech. And either he gets to make a speech and thinks the media will cover it, which they don't. Mm-hmm. Or he thinks that the judge will shut him down, which the media will cover. And he gets to use that. And it's not the same. It doesn't give the same degree of penetrance or power, Hmm. but that's what he's trying. So, yeah, his rallies are different. Yeah. We ought to be uh, taking note along the way here. We we talked about this in depth before the trials began about the effects of either allowing or not allowing cameras inside. And we ought to be uh, bringing that analysis back up. The last couple of courtroom rants have made a small splash in the media, but it hasn't been everywhere and and maybe it's the lack of video footage that does it. I mean, we're just video oriented, right? And charcoal renderings isn't aren't enough for us, right? So you know, uh, so I'm leaning to think about. toward uh, okay, maybe it's all right if they don't have cameras. Yeah, I'm starting to think that might be the better angle. And uh, leave the leave the federal courts alone. They don't yeah. want cameras. Hmm. So Ryan Burge, who's a scholar who follows these things, notes the difference of the composition of Republican caucus goers versus the general population. Okay. And the general population comes in the cooperative election study. So okay. Iowa caucus, white voters, 97 percent versus 69% in the general population of voters. What was not, that? not the general 97? population of the U.S., but the general population of voters. I, are you all U.S. voters? Yeah. Okay. Uh, 65 or older, 43 versus 22. Hmm. White evangelical, 54 versus 22. <laughs> all right. This was interesting. Bachelor's degree like or church. more, yeah. 53 versus 35. So oh. slight, slightly more educated, which would make sense. If you're going to take sure. the trouble to go to a caucus, you're sort of tuned in. Yeah, that's true. And elderly, sometimes a little GI Bill work there. Rural, 43 versus 20. 43, 20. And okay. at the time he wrote this, he was expecting 150,000. It turned out to be 108. There's 260 yeah. million adults hmm. in the U.S., Allegedly the adult. Yeah. And uh, this was the lowest turnout caucus in a quarter century. Uh, okay, another record. Only about uh, you know 108,000 people out of 2.5 million uh, voting eligible population. Ooh. Well, some of them are Democrats that's, uh, and some of them are 40, cold. That's 4% of Iowan voters, the motivated ones. Hmm. And yes. of those, Trump lost 49% of the vote. Yeah. Well, you had, I mean, I could see a certain motivation in coming out and saying, hey, I, I vote, I'm going to stay a Republican. I just can't take it with this guy anymore. Even though he's going to romp, I got to show up so that it's not 100%. Yeah. On the one hand, uh, in the Iowa caucus, you could register as a Republican as you showed up. So Democrats oh. could go, but there was only about three or 4% Democrats. That's what happens every year. It wasn't 
you know, overwhelmingly more than usual. I could. So see if that. Nikki Haley was was counting on Democrats to show what? up, then uh, she's in the wrong. Didn't party. happen. She's in the wrong party. Yeah. Well, uh, you know what's funny is uh, I moved to vacate her chair. She was looking for support from Democrats to get passed, and this is horrific. And uh, uh, me and Marjorie Taylor Greene are on the same page on this one. So uh, both Jonathan Martin, who now is at the Politico, back of Politico from New York Times, right, you mentioned and G. Eliot Morris, who now runs 538, hmm. both noted the thing, the statistic to take out of the entrance polls. They don't do exit polls at Congress as they do entrance <laughs> polls. Entrance polls. All right. No wonder people don't go. <clears throat> this is the most important number, said G. Eliot Morris, to come out of Iowa tonight. The rest you already knew about. Is Trump fit to be president if convicted? Remember, these are Iowa Republican voters, the most committed of mm. the committed, the ones who should be committed. Really? Yeah. Right? Is Trump fit to be president if convicted? Oh, oh, if convicted. Not just right now, but okay. Yeah. And right. 63% said yes, 32% said no. That's okay. an enormous number, 32%. It is. Uh, 32% more. Who used to advertise with that? Yes, uh, it's true. I mean, if you're if, um, among that demographic, a third of them say he would not be fit to be president if convicted. I don't know what they say about right now, but okay. So Chris Hayes looked huh. at that. Well, right now, uh, 49% didn't vote for him. Uh, that's, that's true, too. Right yeah, but I want to know. Is he fit right now? No, he's not. Okay. But all right. Uh, but still, big number. And Chris... Hayes. Chris Hayes uh, looked at that and said, you mean because the potential general election implications of the 32 percent? And Julia Barra said, yes, I doubt yeah, there's I a one to one so. impact on vote. A big percentage of the 32 will vote for him anyway. But it's yeah. much bigger than I've seen in other polls and points to a significant slice of soft support, at least in a vacuum. Hmm. So uh, I was having this discussion I told you about uh, with Liam Donovan yes. before the caucuses. And I thought his support was soft, and I think the 49% says it's soft. Everything about him is soft. And a whole bunch of other people think it's soft, too. You know, So uh, uh, let me give you uh, an example. Ron Brownstein, also right in The Atlantic. Uh, what Trump's victory in Iowa reveals, the result offers him some warning signs. It was strong in the sense that he, he beat his nearest rival by 30 points. But mm -hmm. noteworthy was voters' response to an entrance poll question about whether they would still consider Trump fit for the presidency if he was convicted of a crime. Nearly two-thirds said yes, uh -huh. which speaks to a strength within the Republican Party, but about three in ten said no, which speaks to possible problems in a general election. And, you know, my issue, which I've uh, said repeatedly here and everywhere else and to anybody who would listen to me, is the media gets so f caught up and focused <laughs> Oh, okay. On a meaningless Republican caucus and primary, they yes. don't pay any attention to the general election. Uh, one example is, oh, Trump won by 30 points. Look how strong he is. Mm -hmm. Yes. Completely out of context. This is a tiny slice, a tiny sliver of voters in Iowa. Yes. And that doesn't translate to the general election, which, by the way, is the important thing. Not this caucus. Trump is going to be the nominee. That's been evident for months. And so, you know, if you want to try to make the story about whether or not Haley can hold Trump lower than 50 in New Hampshire, go ahead. But so what? Mm. Yeah, it is interesting how they uh, I mean, that's that's the template, right? The Iowa caucuses matter for reasons. And, and so then you get your ticket out. Yeah. Right. And right, somebody right. said to DeSantis. Uh, how do you get a ticket out when, like, you got 20 and he got 50? Hmm. And I guess one of his advisors said, all right, so it's coach. It's it's a <laughs> ticket where you sit at the back of the plane, but it's still a ticket. Yeah, well, right. I, I mean, I don't know what yeah, to say. Yeah, it's one of those tickets where, like, they send you to the wrong place and divert you to another <laughs> airport and your luggage goes on to Indonesia. You know, right. but There's it's five a ticket. connecting flights. Uh, I guess so. I mean, I I, what, I, it's an interesting question too. You know, what do you mean ticket? I, you know what? I don't know. You tell me. You guys have geared up, and uh, and you're ready to cover an entire primary season. There's 50 of these states, you know, and then there's some primaries and some territories in the District of Columbia and yada yada. I'm you're all set to go and cover it. Is there no ticket? Then what are you doing here? I don't. Should, doesn't this tell you you should be covering this thing differently? 
Yeah. But no, it just means I should be harassing Ron DeSantis. And I am all for that. Maybe be looking at policy. Maybe you should be looking yeah, at Yeah, or something. Uh, you know, Stakes, family. not the uh, horse race, or what's going on. All right, right. There's plenty going on in court. There's more interesting contests coming up in court <laughs> than there are right. in the the primaries. But they, I don't know. They. It's amazing how frozen they are in that in that mode even when they're i mean I, I know they're desperate for action given that there's essentially two incumbencies going head to head here which means there are no competitive primaries anywhere and nothing for them to do for a whole year right so, so if you're looking oof. at the republican primary or if you're looking at the Why? republican electorate as a whole okay is there a difference between uh college and non-college uh college is the difference well, yeah, but also who they vote. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Mathematically, is there a difference? Sure. Solve for well, the, a voting pattern. X equals college. Yes. All right. That 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 difference. Right? Yeah, the probably. College educated Republicans are the ones that uh, have uh, moderate leanings who might mm. wind up voting for Biden in the end. Okay. They were all, or they, they might all took stay home. Criminology and, courses. And uh, Ron Brownstein notes that on that front, remember, thirty-two percent of this very conservative evangelical electorate uh, uh, thinks that Trump would not be qualified to be president if he's convicted. On that front, hmm. Ron Brownstein notes, it would be worth filing away that more than four in ten—that's more than forty percent. Okay who participated in the caucus said they wouldn't view Trump as fit for the presidency. In other words, his support is softest with college educated. We knew that. Here's more proof. Okay, right. Those are Haley people. And that's why uh, Haley's numbers suggest that early on, we told this uh, story on Monday, that, uh, you know, uh, a majority of her voters uh, would rather vote for Biden. So it wasn't mm -hmm. crazy for me to say that. Right. Yeah, well, I, I, this is who they are, you know. So uh, now as we're looking at the rest of the country, obviously this matters most in the swing states. Yes. But these caucuses are way more conservative than the general electorate. And if right. they think that, what's the rest of America going to think? Uh, that he is unfit for the presidency. I hope. Yeah. Uh, and they, I hope they, they start speaking up soon. But we have to wait for the most dedicated crazy people – to vote one after another after another uh, and, and, and I don't know, drag this out, I guess. Right. And, so anyway, yeah. that's what happened at the caucuses. And there were some great postmortems. Uh, my favorite, perhaps, is again, from the for Atlantic, more this one is, uh, who wrote this? Elaine Godfrey. All right. Ron DeSantis' cold, hard reality. The Florida governor hung on from runner-up mm. in Iowa's GOP caucus and a very distant second and they yes. talked about how people came to see them and, you know, what people said and what people didn't say and some of his ardent supporters and how they used to argue with Trump people and such. And then she writes, what brought him down? As many have noted, the governor lacks personal warmth. Uh, yes. And, and, and capacity day. for small talk. He's seemingly unable to stand naturally. His hands are always <laughs> slightly raised as though he's wearing too many layers like Randy in A Christmas Story. <laughs> Okay. DeSantis has an unsettling habit of licking his lips when he speaks, lizard people Yeesh. there, and his smile never quite reaches his eyes, which seem full of terror. <laughs> you can almost hear the thoughts in the back of his head. How am I losing? Why aren't I connecting? Wow. I wonder the if he Iowa has... GOP strategist told me. The heel lips mm. haven't helped at an event in Davenport <laughs> two days before they? the caucus. DeSantis passed me on the way to the bathroom, waddling stiffly in a pair of shiny black boots. <laughs> okay. Perhaps the crumbling of the DeSantis campaign could be blamed at least in part on Trump and his allies. Hmm. Even in Iowa, Trump and his allies were relentless. Last night, this uh, uh, one guy no, no, no. that she was following who defended DeSantis against everything stood up again. And, uh, wa and she watched in real time as this fellow came to the realization that so many others already have his party are not who he wishes they were. Ah, yes, we have that feeling a lot. Right. So uh, uh, this guy uh, calls the reporter from the road, sounding more dejected than he had when he'd left. For 30 minutes, he sighed and paused and quoted the Bible. Our people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, he said. He won't vote for Trump or Biden in the fall, he said. But uh, he might move to Florida. He's getting sick of this place. <laughs> move to Florida, though. <laughs> it's cold. 
I mean, I guess so, but she, I mean, oh, all right. Oh, well, he was a DeSantis supporter. He was DeSantis DeSantis supporter. Okay. I was like, but you realize that DeSantis, okay. Yes. All right. So I forgot that this guy was a DeSantis supporter. He was just too mopey. And I, but he won't vote for Trump that. is my point. Yes. Right. That was the, that and he'll move to Florida. Uh, okay. Well, all right. that's and true. Then one and, more or thing, Biden. Uh, for not that only matter. did DeSantis lose on uh, Monday, he lost yesterday. Uh, sure, why not? Where? That's what happened? because there was a special election. There was. Yes. There was a state senate uh, and uh, in Florida, and Navy veteran uh, oh. Tom Keen, that's K-E-E-N, not to be confused with the New Jersey Tom Keen. Navy veteran Tom Keen flipped a Republican health seat in the state house development that represents DeSantis' second electoral humiliation in the span of 24 hours. A close supporter uh, of his was defeated, a school awesome. board member. Oh, and, uh, you know, he's uh, he lost. The Democrats won the district. So, yeah, uh, Florida is overwhelmingly Republican right now. But Democrats are actually making a bit of a comeback. That's pretty. That's a good story. And I, I wonder whether it's less about, oh, that's a big supporter of Ron DeSantis and he's a loser uh, than it is about, oh, this is one of those school board nuts and we're sick of these guys already. Well, Republicans it's put one, $1.5 million into that race and Democrats put in $1.2 million. Oh. Okay, so that so would be less they were than. both like really really into it. It's a slightly blue leaning district that uh, DeSantis had dominated during hmm. his election. So you know, just interesting good. stuff. Good, a good recovery then. Uh, you know, not a total shocker then. I guess if it's slightly blue leaning, but uh, what was he doing getting all that support there? I don't know. People are coming to that realization that he's an idiot and they can't take it anymore. I'm sure well, the school just an, another thing special election didn't help. Ah, that's true, too. That's true, too. It's a pretty pretty long streak, though. All right. That is good news. I'll take it. And uh, if it humiliates the guy in a waddling around in cowboy boots, so much the better. Hmm. Okay. Well, we'll be right back and uh, probably have more bad news for him after this. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrox at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the Kegro in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Well, sort of, kind of, I guess. Netroots Radio is out once again, but uh, that's the thing we say when we come back from breaks, and you know that, and uh, all of this will, uh, of course, uh, be preserved for podcast later on. Um, apologies to everybody who's two days in a row waiting for the live stream to come, but January's a rough month. Uh, kind of always is. Uh, blah, blah, Climate blah, change, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, but uh, we're here, we're doing the show, we're going over the important things, we'll add some more so stuff to it later. I got another factoid for you from yeah. the Iowa caucuses. All right. And they are called caucuses because they, like, there's many of them in all 99 uh, counties. Yes, right. Not conferences. It's like 1,900 districts or something like that. I don't know how many there are wow. actual, you know, I don't know if each one caucuses. Everybody's their the, own uh, caucus. Caucus I, the, the total number of them, I don't know, but uh, hmm. 108,000 people show up. Vivek yeah. Ramaswamy Was one of got them. around 9,000 votes. That must have been fun. And Tyler Buchanan tries to put this in perspective. Mm-hmm. He lives in Upper Arlington, Ohio. Uh, okay. Okay. Upper Arlington, Ohio, 9,000 votes would have been third. <laughs> In a city council race, Oof. in a city of 36,000 people. Well, that's probably about what he'd How get, How many too. people vote in the Ohio caucus compared to Upper Arlington, Ohio mm-hmm. city yeah, council yeah. races? I'm just saying, uh, it is so unrepresentative of the entire population, the voting population. Yeah. Uh, in some cases, it is representative. If they all voted, Trump would still win. Don't get me wrong. But one of the reasons Democrats are not doing this anymore mm. is exactly for that reason. 
It's yeah. just not representative. It's not representative of the country. It's not even representative of Iowa. Hmm. Well, there you have it. More facts that uh, prove that that was a pretty good decision. Um, by the way, I mean, don't you we, do we not think, uh, speaking of Congress as often as we do, that the Republicans in Iowa should change the name of their caucuses to conferences? Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe they should just change the name of the state and start over. Oh, well, it's another possibility. Right. What, what would they pick if they could? Start uh, over? North Iowa. Oh, well, sorry. very cold. So though. they can argue with South Iowa. <laughs> Civil War. Yeah. Uh, it's not. Or maybe they could slavery. do uh, Iowa and uh, West Iowa. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I wonder how they would divide. How, I wonder how the demographics do divide. Every state has some sort of division. Right. East, west, or they can call south. themselves East Idaho for all that matters, really. Uh, I guess so. Uh, the, all right. The, the whole, they you know, to. justice of New Hampshire primary isn't really a prime. It's a primary, but it's it's mm-hmm. not according to Democratic National Committee rules. Therefore, the because Biden they're insisting on uh, first. campaign committee doesn't consider it legitimate. So Biden is not participating. This is important because whatever happens Mm. and how many threes or nine votes Dean Phillips gets, it doesn't matter. Well, he could win Dixville And people are starting to write, well, Trump only got 51%, even though he's the incumbent for all practical purposes. If Biden ever got 51%, my my God, God, what would that mean? Look at New Hampshire. Maybe you will find out what that means. How will you find out what that means? Biden is not participating in the primary. He's not running. But that's because he's a loser and good news for John McCain. Right. So, uh, you know, the point is that the Iowa caucuses, as Democrats have recognized, and perhaps this year because of what happened in the low turnout, Republicans might recognize it's an anachronism. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know you like it. I know you'd like to keep it. New Hampshire wanted to keep their primary first. It's not happening. People are moving on. Well, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm hoping that they understand. Already this happened on the take Democratic it. side. Yeah, I'm hoping that that, that sinks in because it, it worries me now. Thinking about what we were just saying about the way reporters treat the Iowa caucuses, despite the fact that there's no contest going on, et cetera, et cetera, feel like they have to do it anyway. And I wonder whether they all feel like, well, uh, I understand. Sure, intellectually, you told me that uh, Biden wasn't participating. And yet here I am in New Hampshire because that is where the ticket said I was supposed to go. Ticket? Well, yeah, my Biden ticket out. <laughs> gets 51% of the vote, do you know what that means? He gets a, a ticket, ticket out of New Hampshire. To, to but he wasn't Iowa? in New Hampshire. So what good is a ticket out of New Hampshire? Maybe trip. I don't know. Yeah. I, so I, I feel like they're... All these they're dumb all... analogies that just don't work anymore and they can't give it up. Uh, yeah. Uh, and and yeah, they're they're all going to head to New Hampshire. They're, all, they're going to report what happens there. And they might... Put it in context. Oh, yeah. But, you know, that's a whole paragraph of their precious number of words that they're allowed in, in print to say, well, because the Democrats said uh, they weren't supposed to go first, but they decided to go first anyway. They decided then that the primary wasn't going to matter. And so, therefore, Biden didn't go there. And then, da da da. da. And so, but uh, anyway, the point is, yeah, uh, I'm afraid they won't explain it. And then they'll just say, wow, I, 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 can't, I can't believe that anybody would come out of that with uh well there's a real chance for dean phillips now or something because he you know got 11 votes in in the state and in, in that state that can do it uh or he won dixville notch or whatever all right well we'll wait and see uh, maybe they won't disappoint us i don't right I don't for really those of you who like policy jill lawrence just came out i mean just published this moment just now in the in the Fresh. bulwark uh a piece about uh not why desantis lost yeah, he's awkward. He's also short and he puts lifts in his shoes and such. Uh, but that's not why he should have lost. She writes about all the policy reasons he should have lost. He deserved to lose. Well, well good. Like he's he leader of the COVID resistance, for example. Yeah. Well, he's trying to make America Florida, whether you like it or not. People don't want that. No. I mean, those are a couple of good reasons why he should have lost. And so, yeah, I'm yeah. all right with that. Yeah, it is. I, I certainly enjoy that aspect of it that and uh the number of people who've been pointing out all the terrible things that people in florida have had to endure politically so that he could amass a uh, a, a massive loss in iowa that might not even be a ticket 
Right. Tom Nichols writes in The Atlantic. I told you there's a bunch of articles in The Atlantic. Yeah, really. Holy cow. This one is, uh, Trump wants revenge and so does his base. Many of his voters can't accept what's happened over the past several years and they blame other Americans because, like, that's what they do. Sure. That sounds like a, a true thing. Right. So Donald Trump basically is the vehicle for years of humiliation. Well, you might ask, why am I constantly being humiliated? A... a personal crusade for vengeance against the American system of government. These voters aren't settling a political right. score. They want to get even with other Americans, their own neighbors, for simmering and unexpected humiliation that many of them seem to have felt ever since wearing loyalty to Trump. A lot of people, especially in the media, have a hard time accepting the simple truth. Millions of Americans stung by the Come electoral on. rebukes of their fellow citizens. Remember, a lot of the uh, 2020 was stolen, people lost have become so resentful and detached from reality, they plunge into a moral void, a mm. vortex that disintegrates questions of politics or policies and replaces them with heroic fantasies of redeeming a supposedly fallen nation. That's where you get all the uh, mm. uh, pastors gathered around Trump saying, God sent him to be our vengeance, you know, yeah. that kind of stuff. He's, he smells terrible, but boy, what vengeance he's going to be. In Iowa, 19% of 502 likely GOP caucus attendees said Trump's statement that he might have no choice but to lock up his political opponents made them more inclined to vote for him. <laughs> He's playing the hits. One out of five might not seem like a lot, but another 43% said they didn't care one way or the other. Oh, well, uh, that's not wonderful. Lock right. them up. See, they'll care pretty quick. Right. The words of actual Trump supporters are even more unnerving than looking at raw poll numbers. My friend, the writer David French, lives deep in MAGA country. You can go to social gatherings here in the South, he wrote, and hear people whisper to friends, don't talk about politics in front of dad. He's out of control. Hmm. Okay. Right. David's also a lawyer, David French, and he notes, I know that rage and conspiracies aren't unique to the right. During my litigation career, I frequently faced off against the worst excesses of the radical left, but never before oh, come on. have I seen extremism penetrate a vast American community so deeply, so completely, and so comprehensively. But P.S., uh, right. And then he talks these. about Mickey Coppins going to the Trump rally. Mm -hmm. Right. So he spoke with a nice lady named Chris, a 71 year old retired nurse in orthopedic sneakers. OK. Uh, yeah. You think Trump should still be president, said Mickey Coppins? By all means. And I think behind the scenes he maybe is. Oh, well, all right. Mean? Well, military wise, it's supposed to be for the people against tyrannical governments. I hope he's guiding the military able uh, uh, step by step and do what they need to do. Uh -huh. If Trump, uh, if the Democrats try to steal the election again in 2024, the elements of the military might need to seize control. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, she thinks she's in Pakistan. What can turn an ordinary person into the family powder keg or even a deluded seditionist who hopes the U.S. military will seize control of the country? Orthopedic sneakers? Uh, maybe. These <laughs> voters are unable to accept what's happened over the past several years. Trump quickly made fools of them. His various inanities, failures, and possible crimes. If in 2016 they suspected, rightly or wrongly, that many Americans looked down on them, they now know with certainty it's true. Yeah, well, nowhere else to look on them. Right. So the only good thing that came out of Iowa last night is we're now spared further public performances from Vivek Ramaswamy. Yeah. And it's a hopeful sign that nearly half the caucus goers chose someone besides Trump. You know, it was more than me that noticed that. Yeah. Like every single article and uh, piece well, that, that I that's quoted good. in the Pundit Roundup today noticed that. Uh, yeah. Well, I hope that uh, the, the uh, I don't know the media at large will will catch on. Uh, you know, we we tend to read a certain niche of people who are smart and observe such things. And uh, the question is, does it get passed on in the local news? Well, all these media people are passing it on, so I think they're okay. aware. You it know, could the question be slow. Is, what do they do with it? Yeah, it may take a while. Uh, I hope uh, I hope that it penetrates. I mean, more importantly, will uh, Nikki Haley hold Trump left to less than fifty in New Hampshire hmm. next I, week? Yeah. Well, I, on yeah, a Tuesday, so we cover it on Wednesday. Yeah. Well, everybody can wait a couple of days. It's uh, I guess how many of these contests do you have tolerate having in a row before people say, "Well, I don't understand." They keep saying that there's some contest going on, but. All the delegates are going to Trump, so can't we stop? Well, I don't understand. Uh, Trump keeps saying he's innocent, but like every day he's in yeah. court. What's going on there? Well, yeah. Th th then they have no choice. I, I, they could. I guess the Republicans could just suspend all their primaries to show that he's not a dictator and all. Yeah. 
Well, you know, we can suspend the courts to show that uh, oh. you know things are fair in this country. Yes, and that's what uh, that's part of the that's part of the MAGA fantasy is that right. Uh, right Meanwhile, that if they the can't world, win, they'll redefine everything. Here's a piece from Axios you probably haven't heard of because, like, we're too busy talking about whether or not Haley can hold Trump to less yeah, than fifty yeah. percent in Super New Hampshire. Important. Axios reports uh, 63% of Americans rate their current financial situation as being good, including 19% who say it's very good. Oh, wow. And the outlook for the future is rosy. So Americans are actually pretty happy with their finances. You wouldn't know that from the vibes economy crap. Right. It's all horrible uh, and in the newspaper Except people somehow. don't really think that. No, they don't. And uh, what I saw this morning, but didn't, uh, didn't park it anywhere, but... Uh, I guess the consumer spending numbers from January or rather from uh, December are all done, the, the holiday shopping season. And, uh, you know, a huge improvement and it capped off the, uh, the end of the year with the, the biggest increase in consumer spending in quite some time, which is exactly what people do when they are uncertain about the future and worried about the economy. And think that they might lose their jobs. Right. Go out and spend everything you've got. And uh, roll the dice on the next year. Yeah, I, it's, you don't have to be a you know on hopium to to <laughs> to think the economy is good. You just, I mean, it might be your practice to lie to pollsters and say you hate the economy, but then you might you know want to seek help or something. So, but I don't know. That seems to be the big a big pastime. But I don't know what you do when the numbers say something totally different. You're supposed to be a quant. Look at what's happening. Right. Also in the real world, as of yesterday, although Trump did show up, didn't say much and really wasn't covered all that much. The E. Jean Carroll mm -hmm. uh, trial goes on and the, the jury was selected. One. And interestingly, oh. uh, one of the jury questions was, uh, did you vote? Did you vote in 2020? Did you vote in 2024? Did you think the yeah. election was stolen? Oh, and there were at least two jurists who said, yeah, it was stolen and they were not selected. Well, there you go. That's a great way to get off a jury. Not for a uh, Trump But jury, the thing but is, you know, people Trump said that, now. hey, you know, this if this looks like a jury you could easily get off. Yeah. And like some people nobody said, asked to. <laughs> some people said, "No, no, Everybody no. Wanted I'm to here to it. I'm here to to tell you what I think of Trump, damn it." Um, yeah. yeah, well, you know, that's one of the problems for Trump criming in New York. Yeah. York, he wasn't DC. thinking about that at the time. He didn't know he was going to be president and later be held to account for it. Right. But Right. If he did sorry. anything criminal, he should have done it in Idaho. Right. That was the place. Or uh, last night in Iowa, I guess. Mm. Or the night before last. Um, when all the police were too cold to come look for him. Uh, right. the, yeah. All right. Well, good news for, for that. And, uh, and if you really are interested in getting off of the jury, uh, it's a good way of doing it. Um, but the you know, big jury pool... And, uh, yeah, that's, I guess, a question you got to ask now. Did you think the election was stolen? Mm. Was it going to get me out of here any faster? It, uh, it, maybe. You know, and, yes, it was stolen you know, twice. That'd be funny if, like, you go into your local courthouse because you're selected for jury duty. And it's, you know, this uh, local superintendent who improperly fired a uh, teacher and the teacher's suing. And uh, they're doing jury selection and you say to them, oh, I just want you to know, I think the 2020 election was stolen. Do, do I get out of jury to it? I no. Didn't ask you I didn't ask you that. <laughs> this has right. nothing to do with any of that. No, this no. is happening. Here. Sir, this is a Wendy's. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> do I get a discount? <laughs> no. What's Chick-fil-A? Do I get a discount? No. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, so that's something people can do. Um, you know, also, right for social distancing as well. Right. I forgot my mask. The election's stolen. Everybody moves away. Sir, this is a Chick Fil A. We invite you back on Sunday. <laughs> All right, you get a. You're going to get a text that says uh, the the election is on Sunday at Chick Fil A. Sure. All right. That's my polling booth. I'll be there. <laughs> All right. Well, that is. Oh, oh, I forgot to say. Oh, there's something. Something yeah. you forgot. What? After the the uh, caucuses, what not else? only did Vivek Ramaswamy uh, suspend his campaign so we don't have to listen to him anymore, yeah. so did so. Asa Hutchinson, oh. although it is not clear mm. where his voter is going to go. <laughs> He's moving to Arkansas. Um, 
Yeah, that's <laughs> there's one one guy who's very upset who's been standing in the corner all along. Well, my hats way. off to Asa Hutchinson. He said he wouldn't vote for Trump, and he stuck to it, and good for him. Yeah. Well, and now so he's out too. I forgot that he was there. Um, the good news is, I can certainly say we don't have to listen to Asa Hutchinson anymore. Though I I enjoyed. I never heard him. So too. yeah. You know. That, that's uh, not an issue. Uh, it's not a not a big deal. Uh, and yeah, with Vivek Ramaswamy. By the way, I also understand from the other place that Elon Musk, I guess, must have spent a couple of days prior to the Iowa caucus telling everybody that you know, he had real insight into the situation. And uh, Ramaswamy Vivek is going to do much better than yeah, anybody thought. He's right. Saying. It totally outperformed the polls. They're all wrong. Everybody yeah. was out for Vivek. Ramaswamy And, of course, a lot Iowa. of people on Twitter said to him, you know, Elon, you have a lot of money, but you're really stupid. Oh. Are they allowed to say that on there? Did well, they, they said it at least once. I don't know if they're banned now. Right. But he, he got a lot of that feedback. Well, uh, that is, seems money like true feedback. doesn't make you insightful uh, in regard to your ability to figure things out. Mm, no. And thank you for proving it. Yeah. Well, uh, he's he'd already done that. So, all right. So he's out. Uh, also, a lot of people think Vivek Ramaswamy is a young guy and apparently got a lot of money himself personally. And so that's that equals mouth power in this country. And, you know, he may be back. He may, I don't know, he may challenge Carrie Lake for Senate in, <laughs> in Arizona. Who knows where he uh, will helicopter to next and try to run for office somewhere. This happens a lot. We had uh, Yang hanging around for a while saying he was going to run for everything. We might not be done with him forever, but it really would be wise if he just said, uh, mm. I, I'm famous now and that's enough for me. I'll go do TED Talks and and be a billionaire or whatever he is. Is he that rich? Is he a billionaire? Mm, I don't know. I don't even mm. remember. Who cares? I never listened to him the first time. But he's got enough money to bother people for a while. If that matters, like uh, the other guy uh, who's wasting all his money, uh, uh, embarrassing his introvert wife. Uh, what should well, <laughs> the billionaire who's uh, well, there's, there's uh, married to Nary Oxman? You know, why, I think we always get his the, name the wrong. Why, why talk about uh, Bill Ackman that much? That's the, is because it, it's he Acker. gave a million dollars to Dean Phillips. Oh yeah, that's it was true. A great example of what <laughs> he happens. did do that. When you have money and politics mix. Yes. Okay. He gives a million dollars to Dean Phillips and then has a chat with him and Elon Musk, uh, Dean mm. Phillips and, and Bill Ackman on wow. Twitter as if that's important. And all of a sudden, Dean Phillips removes his DEI comments from his website and thinks that it shouldn't exist. Okay. Good Democrat. Because Dean Phillips is just such a wonderful guy. Yeah. That's... That's pretty amazing and and pretty transparent. Well, you know, it's it's funny. I'm sure he's trying to hide it, but it it makes him rather transparent after all. Yeah. So, so I mean, sometimes things are clarifying, and this is one of those clarifying moments because, mm, like, now you know who he is, yeah. and now you know what he did, and now you you can see it. You know, and it, it, usually that stuff's kind of secret, but no, hmm. not this case. Very interesting. It's just interesting that he, you know. Rose to prominence this way. Uh, I mean, I mean, it was a good play, I guess, in terms of just generally. I, no one knows who Dean Phillips is now. Everybody's beginning to know that he's that guy who had a hopeless campaign and then did that dumb thing where he met with a money guy and instantly changed his position and so never vote for him. Mm. But um, I don't know. He's just. Did, I, I don't know how he's doing in his district. I don't know what that means for his future there, or if anything. But uh, <laughs> just, he's out of obscurity now, I suppose. Uh, to what end, I have no idea. Mm. But like Vivek Ramaswamy, I guess. The two of them are in the same boat. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't know if you saw the pictures or the video uh, of uh, Trump arriving at the airport in Iowa without his his super bronze effect. Oh, no. He looked awful. Well, he's he's an awful looking person. Yeah. So he didn't have his bron Okay, I see. Yeah, I don't know if I would have necessarily seen the picture and said, what happened to his trademark orange? I just think the lighting was weird. Uh, okay. I don't even know if that... I think this might be part of it, but um, there there was a video, uh, not this particular still picture that I sent you, but an actual video, which I'll try to round up for you, but he just looks awful. 
Oh, I see. Yeah, not only is it, I mean, I I see his face is a little pale. Look at his and, hand. Yeah, that's it. He's got like sores on his hand or, I don't know, blisters possibly. He may have grabbed, uh, if he was ever in a kitchen, he you might think he grabbed a hot pot or something. Um, yeah, weird. I mean, yuck. It's actually kind of gross looking. Uh, he would say, I'm sure it looks disgusting, and but uh, yeah, no word on how he did it. Uh, what's this this message here? Who's his, uh, Tim Miller? Okay, does Donald Trump does Donald Trump have early stage leprosy? Nah, that's a good question. Um, and does it matter if those little tiny fingers fall off? We can't be sure. All right, I'm going to show you the actual picture, and you'll see what I'm talking about here. This is how it's not up the actual the picture. Oh, okay. The, the of his. Oh, yeah, yeah. I saw the arrival in the coat. Um, yeah, he just o- looked a little shirt, bedraggled. No tie. Very yeah. uncharacteristic for Trump, by the way. Huh. Yeah, interesting. Remember, he used to beat up his kids if they didn't wear a tie to right. Yankee games. That that is a story, and uh, maybe he injured his hand in a tie accident. Uh, that's yeah. why he doesn't have it on there. Of course, the hair blowing all over the place is always a fun thing to see. Uh, usually he's got the hat on. Yeah, it's like he ran out of the house without any of his clothes. Uh, wandered out of the house is more like. Oh, I see. Yeah, orange alert. Okay. Well, uh, he's, he's anyway, not looking you know, good. He's not a healthy guy. Things, so why are we talking about this? Why because one of the things that's happened is that there's sort of been a mini blackout about since you don't cover his rallies, you don't talk about Trump that much. Now you have to. Like he won the caucuses, is going to be New Hampshire, he'll win that next week. You sort of have to talk about him. What are you going to talk about? Well, in our uh, huh. deeply uh, uh, reported intellectual media, uh, no, it's not going to be about policy or his moral failings or even the courts. They're going to talk about his appearance. You know, that's all right. How he looks. Oh, well, yeah, that's what I'm bringing it up. Oh, and well, so okay. actually, they're going to have a lot of material. Yeah, well, I, and I'm for that material. I, I think that bothers him a great deal, and uh, I'm for that certainly, if nothing else. So I'll take it. Uh, although it really would be terrific if they. I mean, I don't know why is it. Why is it not a story that the guy is in court everywhere and losing just so tremendously? And I guess it's just become normalized. Of course, he's losing in court somewhere. It's it's a day ending and why, but you know, some of these things may end with. You know, criminal convictions. And I guess when they do, then they'll report that. I don't see how they avoid it. But, okay. You know, mm. let's see. Uh, oh, I now know what I'll do for the next, uh, or part of the next hour. I have to, I was thinking of the story you were telling about the, uh, going to Trump rallies and interviewing people and the fantasies that the MAGA crowd have about uh, revenge and how they're going to just redefine everything so that. They come out the winners, and uh, I read a very interesting article about uh, a phenomenon that the political scientists are calling county capture now uh, mm-hmm. in political research, whatever politicalresearch.org is. I don't know whether that's uh, – I should, should go and have a look there. But uh, anyway, an interesting idea uh, the, that meshes with – the Trumpian fantasy of hoping that he's that Trump is secretly working with the military in order to ensure his his victory takes hold in 2024, whether he actually gains one or not. That should be interesting. I'll have to share that with you or if you feel like sitting around listening to it. And uh, what we didn't talk about, because hmm. I, like I it, it's not that I refuse to. It's I sort of can't is that uh, Congress is like trying to figure out what to do. Oh, you can't. Like today's the day McConnell no and uh, Mike Johnson meet with uh, their uh, Democratic counterparts and Biden at the White House, the Big Four summit. Mm. And I have no idea what's going to happen because I have no idea what Mike Johnson's about. Okay, uh, no one knows. Oh, he's about uh, Noah's Ark that much we remember. Yeah, no one knows how he'll deal with this. And um, yeah, that's a good that's a good question. No one knows really where he stands. Like with. Kevin McCarthy, you knew he would try anything to try and stay in the speakership. And you assume that Mike Johnson will prefer staying in the speakership, but it's not entirely clear that he won't just say, meh. Right. You know, a final item here, by the way, which uh, we ought to comment on. I told you the New Hampshire first in the nation primary and the Iowa caucuses are anachronisms. It really should fade. Right. 
There'll be no debate in New Hampshire this year. CNN and ABC both have canceled because Nikki Haley said, I'm not debating DeSantis. What a waste of time. If Trump's not there, I'm not there. <laughs> well, that's it. I mean. She lost the last debate to him, but uh, uh, you know, well, uh, that has nothing better to do reason with it, I'm sure. for it. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 there's no reason for anybody to accept debating if they don't feel like it now. Trump has opened that up. So uh, that doesn't surprise me. That there will be no debate, although it, it should, well, you know, it, just, it will surprise New Hampshire. Things are changing. I, you know, you could say, "Well, this is the way we do it." Was you, the way you used to do it? Yeah, this uh, that, this is good. I think this is good, a uh, good development, and it'll it'll help people in New Hampshire, whatever they call themselves uh, or others call them in secret. Uh, they, they can get do over this. It. They can get rid of the filibuster. That's what I say. Oh well, yeah, I suppose so. Things if you can changing. get people used to that. Uh, but yeah, even people in New Hampshire will say, "What? What? This doesn't make any sense. Why are we doing this? The Democrats aren't showing up. There's no debates on the Republican side. Um, you know, all the excitement that used to go along with it of a state full of political junkies, and there's no fix. You know, well, maybe just skip it. But uh, I don't know. Then they won't have anybody to do their laundry. I guess. Mm. There's always that. Okay. Well, good. I hope that changes the culture there. And uh, I don't. Uh, oh, look at this. Okay, here we go. The the alarm. I feel like the alarm has gone off a minute too late here today for some reason, and we may have talked our way straight into the break. That is weird. Okay. Huh. I'm gonna take a look at why why the alarm. Although no one will know because the break isn't really happening. So <laughs> right. So you're saying. <laughs> All right, here's what I'll do. When the uh, 30 second mark rolls around, I will uh, begin the music and we'll, we'll pretend that this is a real and regular show. How could that possibly happen? These breaks, these, these alarms are pre programmed. Okay. I see. Uh, oh, oh, I know. I know what's going on now. All right. Uh, I've uh, forgotten what time. Ta- this is our second break and not our first. That's why. Okay. Very good, Greg. I Does have ruined everything. Really know what time it is? <laughs> I certainly Does don't. Really care? And I'm going to have to. Time. I'm going to have to edit the way this commercial break works. All right, Greg. We will check in again tomorrow if we so can remember said. to do the show. All right. Here's what we're going to have to do here because I have uh, lost track of where everything, the way everything was working, and uh, it won't matter that much. Because, at least for the live stream, won't screw up the live stream because, of course, the live stream is down. I'm answering more texts as we speak about that. But, uh, yeah, okay. And I, my, my confusion at the top of the hour was with the uh, alarm going off at 58 rather than what I was expecting of a 57. But I don't know. Somehow, just a little bit of amnesia. But that is how we deal with the top of the hour break with just a one minute break. And then I hit the wrong button or I, I hit the right I intended to hit the two minute break button and did do so but I should have been pressing the one minute break button and so then I didn't have the musical cue in my head about when to come back all right we'll edit this as best we can and since everyone's getting it via podcast it shouldn't make any difference okay so Greg will be back tomorrow we'll talk more about uh, why the Iowa caucuses don't matter and why the upcoming New Hampshire primaries don't matter i'm sure and then i don't know what all right so for today a couple things i should get to now one i teased this story about county capture which i'm a little now i'm a little bit concerned about the sourcing of it but it's a very interesting concept so i'm going to uh share it nonetheless and then i guess uh, my mission will be to ring the bell for my research assistant and ask him to see if he can find stories in the local papers confirming this theory and seeing whether the facts as reported underlying the theory are in fact actually happening. And now I'm looking here, oh, when when was this article published here too? Some discrepancy. All right, well, it claims on the uh, actual page where it's published to be a current article. For some reason... Looking at the pocket version of it, well, interesting stuff that comes up here. Uh, we'll deal with them, but it, it gives it a 2017 publication date for some reason. I am curious where it gets information like that. Anyway, let me turn first, though, to uh, the story we were in the middle of when we shifted to our discussion with Joan. 
when she called in. I was in the middle of recounting what I think will be the last entry for now, anyway, about uh, the weird version of Civil War history that has been imparted to certain students over decades in this country, whether outright lost cause-ism or uh, something slightly different or just uh, some weird revisionism, whether driven by, uh, I don't know, anger about how the Civil War went or anger about how Reconstruction went or both. But we were learning a little bit about what became known as the Dunning School, named after the uh, professor, uh, history professor ensconced at Columbia University, where you might think, uh, you know, world-leading scholarship was going on or something like that, it being an Ivy League institution, a northern institution at that. And, you know, maybe that was part of the plan. I don't know. Uh, Dunning, as it turns out, not a southerner per se, though perhaps... Uh, I'm not certain what part of New Jersey he grew up in, but the fact is it was New Jersey and that was a union state. I wonder if if Wikipedia can tell us anything about uh, where exactly in New Jersey he was born. But anyway, but uh, you recall, uh, just for background's sake, I'll remind you, we were, one, talking about Nikki Haley and her you know weird reluctance to admit uh, outright that the Civil War was about slavery, even though she pretended to sort of acknowledge that later. And then we read Elizabeth Spears on why that might be the case, that she had uh, received her education in the so-called segregation academies of the South, and that likely had something to do with it, and Spears relating her own experience with that. Um, And what else? We read something else uh, about the subject yesterday as well. Um, But this opinion piece really went into depth in trying to tell the story last year, end of last year, about this historical loss, this historical hiding, really, of the Alabama regiment. The Al- I don't know what size unit this really was, but to some two to three thousand soldiers from Alabama alone, white soldiers who volunteered for, who had to, in some cases, sneak past Confederate lines in order to make it to Union-held territory to uh, enlist in the Union Army, and that they held this place of honor in Sherman's advance, his Sherman's march across Georgia, which may have been political, but still nonetheless did happen, and uh, that the Alabama archivists essentially made some sort of decision to obscure or otherwise bury this this fact about a significant number of Alabamans, Alabamians who had participated in the war, but on the other side, and the strange story of how the scholarship treated it and whether or not uh, they hid this inconvenient fact uh, in order to preserve a cleaner narrative about the war, i.e. that all Southerners were more or less loyal to the Confederacy, because that, you know, for pedagogical reasons, or was it for ideological reasons that they needed to preserve this? It was a very interesting question, and more to the point, this interesting lost history. Uh, so Howell Rains is the author of the piece. You may remember our discussion about it uh, in yesterday's podcast rather than live stream. Former executive editor of the New York Times, of course, and now author of this book about this unit. And this story is partially about the unit and partially about what it means that they've been erased from history. Silent Cavalry, how Union soldiers from Alabama helped Sherman burn Atlanta and then got written out of history. So uh, if you didn't hear yesterday, hmm, well, um, you're out of luck, but you got to go back and and listen to yesterday's uh, podcast to get the full recounting of the first half of the story. But to try to recap briefly and find out where we left off in the story. We can skim through this, uh, that, that a new generation, it begins a new generation of civil war scholars. You might wonder like what a, what a new incoming, a new generation of civil war scholars have to say about this event, which has been so scrutinized in the past. And as it turns out, they're unearthing a lot of things, including how, 
the scholarship was slanted in decades previous such that uh, people didn't even know what they were missing in the Civil War history before. So a new generation of Civil War scholars is filling in what one commentator calls the skipped history of white Southerners who fought for the Union Army. For me, this emerging revisionist account of the conflict is personal. Remember, this is the very beginning of the story. I have discovered the story of a great-great-grandfather who was threatened with hanging as a damned old Lincolnite by his neighbors in the Alabama mountains. So, uh, just to give you that, uh, that, that being the background and the question here, how did a regiment, there it is right, regiment of 2,000 plus fighters and spies from the mountain south, chosen by General William Tecumseh Sherman as his personal escort on the march to the sea, get erased? And, well, there was a lot of background to it. Uh, the, Howell Rains relates, he says, as I, st- as a 10 year old, I stood in the presence. I'm not certain what that actually means, but of Marie Bankhead Owen, who showed me and my all white elementary school classmates the bullet holes in the Confederate battle flags carried by, quote, our boys. She and her husband, Thomas McAdory Owen, reigned from 1901 to 1955 as the directors of the archives in a monolithic alabaster building across from the Alabama State Capitol, and they made the decision not to collect the service records of an estimated 3,000 white Alabamians who enlisted in the Union Army after it occupied Huntsville, Alabama in 1862. Right, so that's the background against which we're working here, and that the Owens were not alone it was what in what was a national academic movement to play down the sins of enslavers. In the files in Montgomery, I found the century-old correspondence between Thomas Owen and Columbia University historian William Archibald Dunning. That's the guy we've been talking about. And, you know, this appears to have been an active plot of sorts, a decision to bury this kind of information and uh, it just didn't play into their narrative, whatever their whatever it was, it was motivating their narrative. Let's see if we can. By the way, so I was speculating about maybe uh, William Dunning, you know, born and raised in New Jersey, could be possibly from Southern New Jersey, and way back when, when it was super rural down in South Jersey, maybe they had more of an affinity with their. Neighbors in Delaware, which uh, was, in fact, a slave state, but nonetheless, uh, you know, basically by force uh, remained in the Union, as Maryland did, because otherwise the Union would be cut off from their capital at Washington, D.C., basically. But no, uh, born in Plainfield, New Jersey. So not a not a southern Jerseyan, but a northern Jerseyan and uh yeah, I don't know. I'd love to find out more about what it was that they mentioned that his father sort of passed this this method, this mode of thinking on to him. But it's just not clear why. Uh, I haven't read why. Maybe it's clear to someone else who uh, has studied his background more, but it's not contained in this article. So anyway, yeah, Dunning... Uh, uh, the, uh, I guess was behind the organization of a pro-Southern slant for the American Historical Association. And I guess he just sort of involved himself in uh, capture of the organizations that defined what it meant to be a professional historian in those days. And, um, you know, was thus able to, I guess, convince everybody inside the 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 historian's world and those on the outside who looked to historians for guidance in this stuff that, yes, the serious scholars recognized by all of the credentialing institutions all think this way about the Civil War and therefore that's not unusual and you should too. Just kind of an odd, uh, you know, regulatory capture analogy, I guess. So, uh, let's see. At the 1909 AHA convention in New York, Dunning scored a political triumph by inviting W.E.B. Du Bois to be the first black Ph.D. holder to address the group and then organizing a scholarly boycott of Du Bois challenge to the Dunning School's white supremacist theory of reconstruction, effectively blocking divergent points of view for several decades. 
All these events contributed to establishing what scholars call the myth of the lost cause as a main theme of Civil War scholarship for the first half of the 20th century, the chief tenets of the myth, of course, being that Southerners were solidly behind the Confederacy, which this, the story of the white volunteers for the Union disproves. The war was about states' rights, not slavery, which, you know, is disproven by everything that there is. And then, of course, African Americans uh, being somehow uh, 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 inferior, and so therefore all of this being justified. And, of course, that's just straight up pernicious racism. Dunning died in 1922, but his scheme to put a Confederate spin on Civil War history worked all the way up until the 1960s civil rights movement, when Dubois' non-racist theory about the positive accomplishments of Reconstruction gained traction. The fact that few Americans have ever heard of the First Alabama Cavalry and the defiant anti-secession activist who led its founding, Charles Christopher Sheets, remember him? From yesterday's discussion, I hope so, because that means you would have heard the show, documents how such historiographic trickery produced what the Mellon Foundation calls a woefully incomplete story of the American past. The Foundation's Monuments Program is spending $500 million, a good remedy here, to erect accurate memorials to political dissidents, women, and minorities who are underrepresented in many best-selling history books. And Howell Raines himself suggests that a good place to start there would be a statue of Sheets in the Alabama forest, although I don't know if he'd want to put it in a forest necessarily, where his Free State of Winston speech urged Alabama Unionists to secede from the Confederacy and sparked a surge of enlistments that led to the founding of the first Alabama Cavalry. Of course, the logic there being, uh, as you find out later in this story, Sheets was elected to the uh, secession convention in Alabama, the statewide convention to decide on the question of secession as a anti-secessionist and went to give a fiery speech there in the face of fiery speeches uh, in favor of secession, which of course led the secessionists to threaten to execute Sheets uh, and all of his uh, anti-secessionist delegation. But anyway, holding the vote uh, ultimately in favor of secession, down to 61 to 39, which is considerably, I guess, uh, you know, for those who were taught that the South was solidly behind secession, you might wonder, how is it that almost 40% of the secession delegation, uh, or the delegations to the secession uh, conference still voted against. And then what did they do? Did they just go home and say, well, we lost the election? Interestingly, in today's world where you hope that they did, go and just uh, accept the outcome of democracy. Uh, well, as it turns out, uh, somehow that is that that defiance is good. They didn't say that the election was rigged. They just said, we don't accept the outcome. And that led to the uh, uh, the logic of, well, if we held that it was unconstitutional and invalid for Alabama to secede from the Union. But okay, we were outvoted. But if there's any logic then to the concept of secession, then what's the logic that prevents this county, Winston County, which uh, strongly opposed uh, secession, and and strongly, and more more to the point, strongly supported remaining in the Union. Why can't we secede from Alabama and just be the free state of Winston? And we're not contiguous with any uh, Union-held territory yet until they, uh, I guess, uh, invade and hold Huntsville. And even then, we might not have been contiguous. We had to cross the river at night in order to make our way to the recruiting stations. But that's what we're going to do. And uh, yeah, how do you how do you fight the logic of that one? If you can secede, then so can we. All right, so let's see. I think about where we left off. Might be oh down around here somewhere. Um, hmm, we got past this part here. The backstory of how Confederate history was written to glorify the defeated side is complicated, and requires a dip into academic historiography and plantation economics. It's also full of odd twists. Uh, here we learn, that's where we learn that Dunning was the son of a wealthy New Jersey industrialist who taught that Southern plantation masters were unfairly punished during Reconstruction. 
And just no explanation given for that here. Maybe it exists elsewhere. Wealthy? Okay, maybe that's the connection. I'm sad about other wealthy people in the South. But New Jersey, a union state, northern New Jersey, not even southern New Jersey, not agrarian, but in fact an industrialist. And uh, I can't. maybe he didn't get any war contracts. That It could be just something as simple as that. I don't know. Anyway, uh, let's see. Just uh, jumping down a little bit further here. Uh, he's describing the Dunning School and how he dispatched his disciples to uh, establish history departments across the country, but particularly in the South that sort of taught this same version of things. Um, but then he goes on to explain, so why did the Alabama mountain folk and hill folk decide that they wanted to have no part of the Confederacy? It's not just that they held small farms and therefore largely had no use for slavery or couldn't afford slaves anyway, even if they weren't necessarily actual anti-racists, they just couldn't afford slaves. They might have been deeply racist just the same. I guess that's not really discussed here. But the connection for them to the Union was that the original, as he puts it, Highland homesteaders revered the old flag that's in, not only in scare quotes it's capitalized the old flag that their forefathers fought for in the revolution and the war of 1812 most of the some 100,000 future union volunteers from the south were jacksonian democrats who hewed to old hickory's 1830 dictum that the union quote must be preserved lost cause historians schooled by dunning and fleming simply We've skipped over the introduction of Fleming, but that's okay. Simply glossed over the fact, as I just did, that white volunteers from the Confederate states made up almost 5% of Lincoln's army. That is a sizable number of people. So what is uh, the upshot of all this? We probably got down to around here. In the case of Alabama, this uh, glossing over meant that the two most uh, oh, you know what? This probably really deserves to be included here. The great achievement of Dunning and the Lost Cause historians of this Dunning school was to create the impression that the vast majority of white Southerners supported the Confederacy, even though two-thirds of Alabama families did not own enslaved people. White support for the war peaked after the attack on Fort Sumter, but declined steadily after Union victories at Shiloh, and for instance, in the spring of 1862. How then did the Civil War become the only conflict in which, as filmmaker Ken Burns told me, the losers got to write the history, erecting statues of Johnny Reb outside seemingly every courthouse in Alabama, even where two-thirds didn't care very much about slavery? Long story short, after the Compromise of 1877 ended Reconstruction, plantation oligarchs regained control of the Southern legislatures and state universities, started churning out history books that ignored black people, no surprise there, and poor whites as well. When national historians set about writing widescreen histories of the war, they relied on these tainted histories produced among the Southerners. In the case of Alabama, this meant that the two most misleading books on Alabama history were footnoted hundreds of times in scholarly writings, despite the fact that they just left out a huge chunk of the war. One was Fleming's pro-Klan Civil War and Reconstruction in Alabama, published in 1905. Dunning boasted that his star student from Alabama was none too reconstructed, I think we may have heard some of this, and supervised the dissertation in which Fleming cast sheets the uh, outspoken anti-secessionist in, in uh, Wilson County, cast Sheets as a coward, silenced by Klan th threats, even though congressional testimony showed that he spoke throughout Alabama, urging former enslaved people to vote for Grant. The other book, Alabama Tories, that's a slanted title for you, the 1st Alabama Cavalry, USA, U.S. Army, 1862 to 1865. So, you know, remembering that they existed, but casting them as Tories, traitors to their state, I guess. Published in 1960 as a celebration of the Confederate Centennial by William Stanley Hool, H-O-O-L-E, the librarian at the University of Alabama. Now, as the chief of the Lost Cause Caucus on the Tuscaloosa faculty, Hool 
carried on the work of exclusion started by the Owenses, right, at the Alabama archives. While they simply sought to bury the 1st Alabama Cavalry, the Owenses, uh, Hull here denigrated it as a lawless band of, quote, hillbilly war criminals who played no significant military role in the Civil War. In a skimpy sentence, he admitted that the Alabama cavalrymen were selected by Sherman as his personal escort on the march to the sea, but he ignored official reports of their value to the Union Army. Those omissions point up another feature of history twisted to fit parochial politics and racial prejudice. For one thing, the 1st Alabama was one of the few integrated union units in the Union Army. The regiment of 2,066 recruits included 16 freed and enslaved people. The shortchanging of its accomplishments also cast a shadow over important events and colorful characters who deserved attention in mainstream histories. My most surprising discovery, Howell Raines writes, was that the 1st Alabama led the Union charge that could have prevented the burning of Atlanta at Snake Creek Gap, I love these names, right? In North Georgia on May 9th, 1864, they had a chance to rout Confederate General Joseph Johnson's entire army by charging into its rear. Never mind how that sounds. Their attack was called off when one of Sherman's favorite generals arrived on the scene. Hmm. In his memoirs, Sherman admitted that his subordinate had cost the Union Army an opportunity that does not occur twice in a lifetime. Interesting. wonder what the politics of that were. The 1st Alabama Cavalry's shining moments came on the march from Chattanooga to Savannah. I never saw an Alabama history that noted the startling fact that the 1st Alabama Cavalry is listed in the order of battle for the Atlanta campaign. How they came to be picked as point of the spear that would be driven through the heart of the Confederacy is a story told in the 2020 University of Virginia dissertation of Clayton J. Butler. I guess that's the new generation of Civil War historians right there for you, which was published last year as True Blue, White Unionists in the Deep South During the Civil War and Reconstruction. Its author is one of a number of rising historians who have published in the past 25 years the research that enabled me to complete my six-decade quest for the full story of Alabama Unionism. That is interesting. At the pivotal Battle of Fort McAllister on December 13, 1864, Alabamians were on both sides of the battle lines. We always heard about brother against brother, but not like this. As the first Alabama faced Confederate neighbors from back home under rebel general Joseph Fighting Joe Wheeler. Later, the first Alabama figured in one of Sherman's most famous demonstrations of the hard war tactics designed to break the will of Confederate soldiers and civilians. Rebel landmines blew off the leg of a 1st Alabama Company commander, Lieutenant Francis Tupper. Sherman rushed to his side and, in a fit of anger, ordered Confederate prisoners of war onto the road, telling them to find the mines by digging them up or stepping on them. Yikes. Probably wouldn't be allowed now. Uh, by way of reward for 1st Alabama's performance on the March to the Sea, General Francis Blair Jr. gave them a place of honor at the right front of Sherman's 17th Corps in the Victory Parade through captured Savannah on December 27, 1864. The presence of Alabama soldiers at Savannah and the burning of Atlanta is the kind of belated news that can cause some Civil War buffs to gulp in surprise. We would say their heads would explode, probably. Another of the new generation of Civil War students, attorney W. Stephen Harrell of Perry, Georgia, has found pension records showing that Sheets himself, having been freed from prison, eventually, rushed to the front to visit his old friends in the first Alabama as Atlanta lay in ashes. Yeah, they don't, don't seem interested in talking about that very much. Removing some of the lugubrious moments beloved by conservative Southerners will allow an appreciation for the internal diversity of a war that claimed about 620,000 American lives. you got to figure among them 
There were going to be stories like this somewhere. And there's more to be learned, especially now that the Black Lives Matter movement inspired Alabama Department of Archives and History's modernizing director, Stephen Murray, to correct the mistakes of the Owen legacy. Even he doesn't know what surprises lurk as catalogers work through the vast files left by the Owens team of lost cause manipulators. That is really something. There's a final uh, paragraph here that I can't quite squeeze in. This is the way it is always with these things. We'll get back to it after this short break. Hi, everybody. It's me, David Waldman. Yes, the same guy who interrupts you all the time. Interrupting you one more time, just to tell you again, another reminder that your contributions are what keep this show on the air, and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, is still among the easiest ways to make the sustaining subscription donations that keep us afloat. Are you ready for the pep talk about how our Patreon campaign is still going strong and growing? Well, too bad! Yeah, the plain fact is we actually are headed in the wrong direction. And whereas we once had about uh, 175 monthly patrons, we're now actually down below 150. Time to recruit some more. Not exactly the kind of news I wanted to share, but there it is. For those of you in a position to support the show, Patreon.com does make it easy to make those secure recurring monthly contributions to do so. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. We've been through a lot together. The worst of the pandemic, we hope. The worst of the insurrection, we hope. So go ahead and treat yourself. You don't need an excuse. Give yourself the gift of a little something you enjoy in life. Support the show. And of course, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running on those options too. So thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We couldn't, or at least shouldn't do it without you hope you'll be on board soon too thanks for all your support all right welcome back now to the cake growing morning show here on netroots radio for the exciting conclusion of the howell rains recounting of the lost history of the people that tend to disprove the lost cause the first alabama cavalry regiment of the u.s army and uh we uh, just uh, in the last paragraph previous, just to recap where we were sitting, uh, finding out about the winds of change taking place in Civil War scholarship, thanks in part at least to the revisionist, uh, uh, or how did they put it, um, um, modernizing director of the Alabama Department of Archives and History, uh, Stephen Murray who has set folks about the task of correcting the mistakes of the Owen legacy, burying the very existence even of the first Alabama cavalry. And uh, even he doesn't know what surprises lurk as catalogers now work through the vast files left by the Owens team of lost cause manipulators. Last year in aiding my research at the archives, He concludes, my grandson Jasper Rains found the muslin, not muslin, muslin wrapped rosters of the first three Alabama companies sworn into the Union Army in 1862. What do you know? They exist. They were just wrapped up separately and kept in a totally different area away from the actual records of every other Alabamian who served in the Civil War for some strange reason. For more than a hundred years, they lay misfiled in the records of the Adjutant General's Office of Alabama's Confederate government. Murray speculated that the young Thomas McAdery Owen might have gotten them from the Library of Congress director who befriended Owen when he was a post office clerk in D.C. in the 1890s. The question remains, of course, as to whether they were purposely hidden under a false label by Owen himself. Based on what I've learned since 1961, when I first ran across Sheets' name in Alabama folklore, I have to guess yes. When it comes to the history of Alabama's mountain unionists' disappearance, is the name of the game. Well, that is fascinating, isn't it? Uh, tying together both the uh, weird history since, oh, I don't know, I guess, uh, the weird hist- the weird mid-century history 
of uh, formulating the idea of the lost cause movement and uh, miseducating particularly southern private school attendees that whole time and uh, uh, of course the uh, the weird proliferation all of a sudden many years after the war of the carbon copy um, uh, confederate monuments that when it came time to challenge their existence and tear them down as symbols of oppression uh, people thought, ah, my, my heritage and my history and remembering that, uh, one, there was often not very much to it and two, that these statues hadn't in fact been there since forever or weren't erected by the survivors of the conflict or anything like that. And, uh, uh, that, uh, in many places, like, I, I'm sure they tried to erect such statues all across Alabama and every county courthouse in Alabama. Uh, ignoring the fact that many of those counties would have been represented by anti-secessionists at the secession convention way back when. So just, just interesting all around. Uh, and uh, I'm glad we were able to shoehorn it into our discussion. And now, uh, maybe now would be a good time to share the, this sort of weird story. And I'm just not sure where it fits in uh, in terms of categorization, I don't know how much credence to give it. I'm going to have to do a little bit of additional research with it, but it seems, I don't know. I guess at this point you have, you're stuck with, it seems truthy. And I, I, I was all ready to just share it as a, you know, at face value. Um, but it occurred to me, okay, well, it's published in politicalresearch.org. Well, what's that? Is that the publication of the American Association of Political Scientists or is that something else? Because it matters. Uh, well, it's something else. And the, the tip off here was I opened it in pocket and I at first got the pocket view and then it offered me the chance to click through to view the original. Now, up at the top is often, uh, I guess, data about the article and where it appears uh, that is frequently incorrect. And I just, I'd love to know how Pocket collects this information and from what sources. But like, for instance, very frequently when I'm reading the Pocket version of something because it's behind a paywall, I'm not sure whether it's identifying the author correctly and I try to click through to the original even if it's paywall, just to see if the the attribution is correct. Uh, and I mentioned here, so when I'm looking at the, the pocket version of it, county capture, it is dated August 12th, 2017, for some reason, in pocket. Whereas if you click through to the original county capture, the name of the article is correct, uh, we, although we also get a subheader here, but it is... Uh, dated January 10th, 2024, like totally different. So I'm just sort of wondering is, you know, where does this come from? But that may, the other thing that made me look is here on the original page, we have uh, politicalresearch.org, which is a publication, I guess, of, uh, or the, the website of the political, political research associates. Well, that's very different. It's not the American Academy or American Association of Political Scientists. It is a distinct group, which the page identifies as we fight for racial. There's different uh, um, verticals here, uh, racial and immigrant justice, LGBTQ justice, gender and reproductive justice and economic justice. And these are all good things, but it. Uh, reveals that okay well it's a you know it's an interest group and an activist group presumably at that um but not you know not a uh, journal of political science or anything like that but but it, it's sort of the article which i skimmed over yesterday it could seemed like it could easily fit in that kind of publication as well um but uh well, there you have it. I don't know. They're political research associates. Um, just by way of background, they have a mission and history page. Political research associates is a social justice research and strategy center think tank of sorts, I guess, devoted to supporting organizations, civic leaders, journalists, and social sectors that are building a more just and inclusive democratic society. All thumbs up and everything. It's just, you should know 
uh, what the source here is. We provide change makers with strategic insights and actionable research in order to identify, disrupt, and compete with movements and institutions that undermine democracy, justice, and human rights. So good. I'm glad about all of that. Uh, the history begins, I guess, in 1981, with political research associates uh, when they began exposing the broad spectrum of right-wing violence through the in-depth analysis of founder Gene Hardesty and analyst Chip Burlett. Originally known as Midwest Research and based in Chicago, it quickly became known for its work in support of racial justice. By 1987, the organization had moved to Boston, changed its name to Political Research Associates, and expanded its research areas of focus. That's all well and good. Um, probably all we really need to know for the moment. The Public Eye magazine though, has been in publication at Political Research Associates, and I guess that's where this is like being carried, although it just doesn't identify itself as such. Public Eye magazine has been in publication at PRA since 1992 to, represent, or to present the latest research on the U.S. right for use by advocates and journalists, which is, I guess, what we're going to be doing here. So what about the substance of the story? Uh, because it was pretty solid and now I, I do want to do some research and find out. So a lot of this is set in Virginia, this story, and I'd like to find out about, uh, I, I guess being in Virginia, I should be able to find out and verify these facts. But, uh, I think this makes an interesting transition from that historical background that Howell Rains was giving us to today, especially as I said, what I was reminded of, um, or I was reminded of this story and that I had it for you when Greg was telling us about the uh, reporters interviewing people in Iowa and finding out that they were largely uh, delusional, the MAGA crowd, and that they had very specific delusions and fantasies about revenge and about uh, the military being primed in some way to help usher Trump back into power. And if you thought that was delusional, you're probably right. But I now have this to add. County capture. Subheader is the role of militias in county governments in where? Central and South Side, Virginia. Oh, no. We got to take a look at this. Carolyn Gallagher and Priya Dixit are the writers of this piece. Again, published over at politicalresearch.org. And it is, uh, I guess, featured in the forthcoming print, maybe, or perhaps just online uh, issue of The Public Eye that uh, we heard about in reading the history of Political Research Associates. So here's the substance. If democracy is a ground-up experience in the United States, that not to say that they're going to grind up democracy when Trump takes over, that's a different thing, but... It, Ground up, grassroots, that is, bottom up. If democracy is a ground up experience in the United States, then county government is the bedrock upon which it stands. That's the premise here. Counties and municipalities are where most people interface with democratic government, small d, of course. It's where they vote in elections, attend schools, visit the library, and call 911 for help with emergencies. When they have disputes with neighbors, County courts resolve them. In some of the northern states, uh, municipalities play a larger role than counties, but uh, for most of the country, county government is the basic bedrock unit. That's true here in Virginia. Much like their federal and state peers, however, U.S. county governments are facing threats from far-right activists. Sometimes the threat is violent. When far-right groups converged on Charlottesville, Virginia for the 2017 Unite the Right rally, you all remember that a white supremacist drove his car into a crowd of counter-protesters, killing a white woman named Heather Heyer, while a gang of white rally-goers assaulted a black man, DeAndre Harris, in a parking garage. But more often than not, the threat is to the body politic, as far-right actors Use the levers of democracy against itself. Common uh, theme in all of this. Uh, uh, aren't 
the people who are for diversity and inclusion, the real racists, because they're being anti-white by not allowing us to be white racists. And where's the tolerance for the intolerant, I ask you? Or isn't the left really the intolerant group? Why don't they tolerate Nazis, etc., uh, etc.? Et and then, of course, uh, the ultimate expression of that right now playing itself out in courts. Why isn't it my First Amendment right to incite violence against the government and overthrow it in an insurrection? Well, gee, that's not really a tough question. But anyway, uh, back to the story here. Far right actors using the levers of democracy against itself. Also a brilliant uh, part of uh, Russian active measures as well. Not just during the last couple of elections, but going back uh, many, many years, both in this country, their country, and other countries where they seek to influence the outcome of politics. Bedford County, Virginia, though, is a case in point. In 2020, the County Board of Supervisors approved a resolution formally recognizing the Bedford County Militia Incorporated, whatever that might be. Shortly thereafter, the militia publicized its collaboration with the county's sheriff, Mike Miller, on its webpage. And you can see here, it's unstated explicitly, but you can see here the uh, overlap between militia weirdos and constitutional sheriffs, the constitutional sheriffs movement, whatever that might really, if you can even call it a movement. But, uh, you know, if you can, if you have one in your neighborhood, presumably that's somebody who's going to be favorably inclined to something like this. What does it mean? Well, we'll find out a little bit more later, but what does it mean? What are they at the most basic level asking the local county government to legitimize militias in some form? Uh, more detail to follow. Let's just continue on. So in 2020, the County Board of Supervisors in Bedford County approved a resolution formally recognizing a militia, which identified itself as Bedford County Militia Incorporated. Shortly thereafter, they publicized collaboration with the county sheriff on their web page. Now, the news that her sheriff was working with an armed militia alarmed Donna St. Clair, a member of the Bedford Democratic Committee. Rightly so. So when the group invited Miller, the sheriff, to speak at the committee, the Bedford Democratic Committee, she asked him to identify the group's commander. Who, who's in command of the Bedford County Militia Incorporated, which apparently has just been recognized formally by our county government? Who is that exactly? Well, According to St. Clair, Miller demurred, saying he would leave it to the commander to identify herself. That's interesting, too. Uh, everyone was appalled, St. Clair recalled. What sort of an armed group gets protected status like that? Hmm, that is a damn good question, right? I mean, imagine the situation. Well, exactly who is this militia that is being formally recognized? I'd rather not say. Really? To understand militia's potential to undermine county-level democracy from within, we've looked at Bedford and three other Virginia counties whose Board of Supervisors considered resolutions to formally recognize militias. Campbell County, Franklin County, and Halifax County. And so, um, let's see. Uh, I don't recognize them all off the bat. Uh, but I would guess that most of them are in uh, southwestern Virginia. Uh, but yeah, let's just take a quick look and find out exactly where everybody is. Now, Franklin County, uh, let's see, Franklin County, Virginia. We'll just take a quick uh, look at the map here with the zoom out in order to see. Yeah, that's uh, way, uh, that's down in the south. West, right, just south, I guess, of Roanoke, which will have perhaps a more liberal contingent uh, included among their numbers. But uh, so we're talking about down near Roanoke, down near Blacksburg, where Virginia Tech is. It is, uh, and it includes, I guess, maybe the county seat is Rocky Mount, for those of you who uh, might have. Uh, um, recognize that name but it's not 
Yeah, well, you might have seen it on uh, I-95 or something, an exit towards, even though, uh, why is it that that gets recognition? It seems like it's still pretty far west of 95. Anyway, let's see. We've got, that is in the southwest. I'm just going to check out the rest of this. Franklin, Campbell, and Halifax. Sure, why not? Uh, Campbell County, Virginia. Likewise, very close by, as a matter of fact. Doesn't look like the map shifted a great deal. So slightly to the east of Franklin County, but still southwestern Virginia. And what was the last one? Uh, um, it's, it's difficult to remember as I'm speaking. Uh, let's see. Halifax, Campbell, and Franklin. Did I do Halifax? Let's take a look. Halifax County, Virginia, uh, just to the south of Campbell. So, yeah, three of these... These guys clustered in the southwest, and I, I imagine that they'll mostly be down in that direction. Okay, so continuing on. These resolutions are part of a process that we, the writers here, call county capture, a form of democratic erosion pared down to scale at the nation's smallest but arguably most important level of democracy. Again, erasing municipalities, but okay. We, as we discovered, these resolutions are part of a larger far-right plan to take control of county governments and put them on a war footing. Oh, so for these people who really think that there's a military preparing the way for Donald Trump, is this more relevant? I mean, it's only four counties in Virginia, so they don't hold sway, but certainly worth keeping an eye on, I would guess. So... Put them on a war footing, as uh, they said, as guerrillas when Democrats are in control and worse still as pro state paramilitaries when MAGA Republicans are in charge. Neither position is good for democracy. So what's this concept of democratic erosion? Democratic erosion. And this made me feel like this was like more political sciency this article than it may actually be. But democratic erosion is a process by which a variety of actors, from elected officials to outside activists, use legal means to chip away at core parts of democratic governance. Oh, the uh, president isn't an officer of the United States. Uh, you can't prosecute a uh, former president because something, something, uh, perpetual immunity. Um, it's a, don't I have a First Amendment right to call for an insurrection? Things like this, among other things. But using legal means to chip away at core parts of democratic governance. This is a very different style of doing that, but those are some other examples of it, including free and fair elections, individual rights, formal checks and balances, and impartial justice. How so? The concept of democratic erosion, or as some others apparently call it, democratic backsliding, emerged in the 1960s amid decolonization in Africa and Asia as newly independent nations tried to establish and stabilize democratic governance in the face of multiple challenges. The term was revived in the early 2000s as post-communist democracies in Eastern Europe and Central Asia began to falter. The concept is useful in capturing the ephemeral nature of democracy since World War II. And remember, the worldwide experience with democracy, yeah, probably a bit more ephemeral than we think of it here as a lasting and durable institution, at least so far in the United States. Between 1945 and 2002, 96 new states were formed and most faced numerous destabilizing forces, including the 1970s OPEC oil embargo, superpower intervention during the Cold War, and IMF-imposed austerity projects in the early 1990s. Not surprisingly, many of these new democracies morphed into autocracies. Most recently, scholars have used the concept of democratic erosion to explain political trends in established democracies particularly after Donald Trump began trampling democratic norms in the world's oldest continuous democracy. In his last few months in office alone, Trump invited a far-right street gang, the Proud Boys, to stand back and stand by. Remember that one? 
when he was asked to condemn the group in a presidential debate. Pressured Mike, uh, Mike Pence, of course, not to certify the 2020 electoral college vote and waited three hours or more before calling off supporters who violently stormed the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. While Trump's efforts undermined electoral politics, democratic erosion can also target individual rights, minority groups, and checks against what the French political philosopher Tocqueville called the tyranny of the majority. You're familiar with that. These erosions can occur even in places that continue to have free and fair elections. This combination of elections and declining rights is referred to as illiberal democracy. Most organizations that track democratic erosion measure it at the national level. But democratic erosion can happen to states or counties and can exist even when the federal government remains democratic. Small d, again. Political scientists call this phenomenon subnational authoritarianism. In the U.S., an established democracy moving towards authoritarianism, militias play a central role in the erosion. What about this militias and democratic erosion in the U.S.? Well, militias, armed groups that style themselves as local guardians, have always been a part of the United States. The Carolina Regulators, Whiskey Rebels, and the Ku Klux Klan all justified their actions as defense of local traditions and mores. And while their goals varied, fighting colonial administrators, preventing abusive taxation, and defending white supremacy all resorted to extra-legal violence. The contemporary U.S. militia movement began in the late 20th century and was defined by its vigorous opposition to the federal government. Some scholars cite the 1980s farm crisis as the start of the movement's contemporary iteration. Others point to bungled federal sieges at Ruby Ridge and Waco. Whatever the trigger, these nascent militias believed the federal government had been corrupted by so-called global forces and was preparing to confiscate citizens' guns. Unsurprisingly, militias took a dim view of federal police forces like the FBI and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, referring to them as jackbooted thugs. You remember that one? The contemporary militia movement also embraces a conspiratorial worldview. In the 1990s, the movement warned of a new world order. Today, it echoes Trump's deep state narrative. Both conspiracies cast members of the U.S. government as internal traitors working with global elites to undermine the country. And I have to note here one of the things I forgot to mention about the way this article is presented in pocket view, right? Not only did they get the date wrong, but it noted here County Capture, the title. It didn't have the subtitle, but instead of giving us the author's names, it was listed as by... Well, by whom? By conspiracy theories, as though it was uh, maybe filed in that kind of a vertical at the at the space where it was published. But they clearly, I don't think they would want to be presenting that as a conspiracy theory. But that was what made me think, oh, maybe we ought to do some research to see whether this story, as it's told of what's happening in the individual counties, is really so. Just throwing that out there because... The word conspiratorial came up in the last paragraph. Now back to the story, which I still think makes a pretty solid point. Key to the movement's growth is a tendency to support existing social hierarchies that favor its largely white male base. Some militias accept openly racist members and others have been willing to appear alongside white nationalist groups at protests like Unite the Right. Some also have supported anti-LGBTQ legislation and participated in attacks on abortion clinics. The contemporary militia movement has been willing to use violence, mostly against people in places associated with the federal government. The 1995 bombing of the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City is the most recognizable attack. But militias have engaged in numerous other crimes since, including threatening Bureau of Land Management agents in the 1990s, occupying the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge in Oregon in 2016, and plotting to kidnap the governor of Michigan, if you remember that one, way back in 2020. Until recently, the threat posed by militias seemed akin to that posed by guerrilla groups in places like El Salvador and Northern Ireland. 
similarly seeking to undermine the federal government, but smaller in scale and organization. By 2017, however, U.S. militias started to behave less like guerrillas and more like pro-state paramilitaries, a very different prospect. And although we are running out of time and won't make it all the way through the article, we want to set the table for revisiting this either tomorrow or Friday to get to the exciting conclusion. But let's set it up this way with one more paragraph. Uh, right, so the, uh, the, the behavior shifting to pro-state paramilitaries, despite continued talk of the new world order and the deep state, many militias made peace with the federal power in Trump's hands, even welcoming federal policing against their common enemies. In 2017, Oath Keepers founder Stuart Rhodes offered to coordinate security with the Department of Homeland Security in advance of an alt-right free speech rally that they expected would attract anti-fascist counter-protesters. The Oath Keepers continued to support Trump into the 2020 election season, serving as security guards at his rallies and on security details for high flyers in his orbit like Roger Stone and Ali Alexander. The Western chauvinist Proud Boys also supported Trump, showing up at protests after George Floyd's murder in the summer of 2020, ready to fight Trump's purported enemies. When asked to disavow the group, of course, there was the stand back and stand by incident in the debate. Within hours of that debate, of course, the Proud Boys were sharing a logo with that phrase on social media. According to Jeremy Bertino, the former Proud Boys then active in the group, membership requests also surged following Trump's remarks. Well, as it turns out, they now find themselves uh, embedding in local county organizations and forming formal relationships with the wackadoodle constitutional sheriffs in those places. To what end? Can't be sure. Is it anything like the revenge fantasy uh, executed through the military that we found out about among MAGA types in Iowa? Listening to Maybe. In the morning with David Waldman. All right. Now, I don't know what's uh, happening next. I guess the live stream, the stream from Netroots Radio is down. So it's not like the usual days when we'll be able to turn things over and say more information to come from Justice Putnam, though he may also be preparing podcasts for your listening pleasure. We'll be back tomorrow. Live or not, we'll find out.